unsuccessful series appearances in 91 and 92. They won it all in 95. A year later, they were back, this time to face the New York Yankees. But after winning the first two games, the Braves hit a wall, and the Yankees took four straight. Last year, the Yanks were back. They swept San Diego and were compared with history's greatest teams. This autumn, Atlanta will try to avenge their 96 defeat and deny the Yankees their third triumph in the last four years. The slate is clean, setting the stage to determine the dynasty of the 90s. Who will prevail? Who will be remembered as the team of the decade? As the final fall classic of the century begins. Game one, next. This is the E Trade World Series pregame show. Tonight, it's game one the New York Yankees versus the Atlanta Braves. For the fifth time since 1991, Atlanta plays host to a World Series. The first time at their new ballpark, Turner Field. And they do it against a team that is already clearly the franchise of the century. Forget about the decade. This is the 36th time the Yankees have been in the World Series since 1921. Welcome to Turner Field in game one of the 1999 World Series. Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Costas. Joe Morgan will join me in about a half hour for the call of the game. First item of business, a change in the pitching rotation for the Braves. The veteran left-hander Tom Glavin, slated to start tonight, has been scratched. He came down with a stomach virus yesterday, and Bobby Cox has had to change his rotation. Greg Maddox will pitch tonight against Orlando Hernandez. Tomorrow in game two, right-hander Kevin Millwood against David Cohn. Then Cox hopes that Glavin will be ready when the series shifts to Yankee Stadium for game three on Tuesday night. We now shift things over to Hannah Storm for the pregame show. Hannah. Thanks, Bob. As you said, this series is a showdown between the two best teams in the 90s, and they have to play game one in temperatures in the 30s, with a wind chill factor in the 20s expected and winds gusting up to 25 miles an hour. But unseasonably cold weather was the least of Bobby Cox's concerns after finding out that Tom Glavin would be unavailable for game one. Cox discussed the pitching change with Craig Sager. Well, after all those moves you made in the National League Championship Series, here you had to make one tonight before you even play game one of the World Series. What is wrong with Tom Glavin? Well, he's really sick. He's got a, a viral um, problem and uh, he's vomiting a lot, lost a lot of fluids, dehydrated, and Tommy called me last night about 11:15, said he just couldn't go to the post, and um, so he uh, got in touch with Craig Maddox and uh, Greg Maddox and uh, told him that he couldn't, and Greg was ready, so I didn't have to call him. And I saw Greg when he walked in today; he was ready to pitch it. So you know, Tommy's the type of pitcher. There hardly, I don't think he's ever missed a start. I can't recall him missing one. He's pitched with a bad arm, a bad knee, two broken ribs, a affected toe, bad ankles, and now the flu's knocked him out. But he should be ready Tuesday. You talk about your pitching staff. You have four aces. Obviously, they are almost interchangeable. But did you feel that the Yankees were more, were more vulnerable against a left-hander? Well, I don't know. You know, I think it's always a little bit of an advantage if you can throw one in New York. If you can, you know, it's not that big a deal. But Tommy pitches Tuesday. He'll be able to get, you know, game three and game seven if it goes that far. So we'll still get him twice. Obviously, the World Series is at stake, but also the title of the team of the decade. Only one World Series title for the Braves so far. Is there a lot of pressure on you and the team this year? I don't know. Each year's new to me. I mean, you start over, and uh, we'd certainly like to win another World Championship, and if they want to throw in the team of the decade, that's fine, too. You know, we'll take both of them. I think it's neat to talk about it. You know, as the media has really uh, talked about it here uh, in Atlanta, and I, I don't see anything that it can hurt, and uh, maybe it is all true that, you know, we are the two best teams. I, I don't really know, but... You know, uh, I know we've had a good run. The Yankees have, so we're ready to play ball, Craig. All right, thanks for being with us. Let's go back to Hannah. Thanks, Craig. And so Bobby Cox sends Greg Maddox, the dominant pitcher of the 90s, against the Yankees. Tonight's pitching matchup is certainly a contrast in styles. For the Yankees, Cuban sensation Orlando Hernandez and his array of deliveries has made El Duque the ace of the defending champions. For Atlanta, the polished Maddox is a four-time Cy Young Award winner, but has only one World Series ring. You win a Cy Young, you're happy, okay? You're really the only one happy, but when you win a World Series, 
Everybody that you work with every day is happy. The team of the 90s has its world championship. I know when we won in 95, you got people coming up to you thanking you, hey, thanks, and you're like, you know, you never, it's something you never thought of. You never thought of how, how it affects the people around Atlanta. The ring represents more for more people, whereas the Cy Young, that's just kind of your own gig. You know, that's just yours. I mean, uh, nobody sees it. <laughs> <laughs> except except me when I go up, you know, go to bed every night, you know, I have to walk by it. Uh, but the World Series ring, I think that's something that everybody can share in. Yankees starter Orlando Hernandez never even dreamed he would play baseball in America, let alone a World Series. Two years ago, El Duque was banished from baseball in Cuba. Determined to play again, he defected and joined the Yankees. Tonight, the MVP of the ALCS looks to continue his brilliant postseason run. Following his legendary career in Cuba, El Duque is now a postseason star in the major leagues with a 4-0 record and an ERA of .97. Cincinnati Reds all-star shortstop Barry Larkin has faced Hernandez. He went inside the batter's workshop to give some insight on El Duque's unconventional style. I only faced El Duque two times in spring training. And from those two at-bats, I can tell you this guy is extremely tough to hit. Normally with the pitcher, you go up top for a fastball, maybe a curveball from up top, drop down for the slider, or maybe even for the changeup. Well, El Duque, the fastball, the curveball, the slider, the change comes from up top, comes from three quarters, as well as maybe side arm or even underneath. That, coupled with the fact that he's got the crazy wind up with the leg motion coming at you, makes it extremely difficult for anyone to hit. These Braves hitters are going to have a tough time with El Duque, especially since they haven't seen him much being in the American League. For game one of the World Series, Barry Larkin moves from the batter's workshop to cyberspace, where he will break down the game at msnbcsports.com. Braves Chipper Jones had an MVP season as the big threat in the Atlanta lineup. The Yankees' Scott Brocious was the World Series MVP last year. Tonight, he steps back on to the October stage. We're closing in on the first pitch of the 1999 World Series. The Braves took batting practice earlier. Atlanta's slugging third baseman Chipper Jones prepared for his showdown with Yankee right-hander Orlando Hernandez. Jones was one for two with a home run against El Duque this season. The 27-year-old third baseman has had a career year with 45 home runs. Atlanta needed his bat more than ever when cleanup hitter Andres Galarraga was diagnosed with cancer during spring training. The switch hitting Jones became the man in the Braves lineup. Here, sat down with some of the pitchers, John Smoltz, uh to name one and he said man this, this year is going to be a test in patience for you because once you know Galarraga w was gone from the lineup uh, I didn't have that big bopper hitting behind me. It's been a big adjustment because I'm not really one to be passive when I go up to the plate. Uh, I want to be aggressive. I want to swing the bat but uh, I have to realize in certain situations I'm not going to get a pitch to hit and I just got to take my base and let, let BJ and Ryan and Andrew hurt them. In the National League Championship Series, the Mets pitched around Jones, walking him nine times. Yankee third baseman Scott Brocious lived his baseball dream last October. His father watched him lead the Yankees to their 24th championship. This season, Brocious lost his father after a long battle with cancer. Last year, we, you know, we had to deal with um, the diagnosis and, and my father, you know, knowing that he had the, had the colon cancer. Um, but again, there was just some great moments last year, you know, for him right after his first surgery to be able to get to the All-Star game, be there for that was really special for him to be able to get down to uh, uh, San Diego and see those games out there. Um, meant a lot to him. It meant a lot to me. He was really trying to get through. Um, to try to make it through this whole season, to make it through the playoffs, um, to be able to see these games, um, and then kind of have the whole family together before he passed, but it just didn't work out that way. 
I lost my mom 10 years ago to cancer, so she wasn't able to see me at all playing the big leagues. I was in the minor leagues when um, when she passed. I didn't have that closure. I was, I was, you know, away across the country, and by the time I had gotten back to see her, she was so far along that I couldn't talk to her. And I didn't, I just didn't want that to happen again with my father. I wanted to have the time just to have conversation, and not anything specific, but just kind of knowing, just sharing time and just and just talking and knowing that we've said everything that we wanted to say to each other before he went. So we made the decision to go home and, and spent four days with him at home. And uh, I wouldn't trade that time for the world. Um, you know, the baseball games are, are what they are. They're games. They're, it's my job. But those four days, the times that I spent with him were uh, times that I'll never forget. The last three months or so of the season, um, you know, he, he physically was, was pretty much just in a bed all the time and the best time for me to call him because of the time difference was on the way to the park and on the way home from the park. So uh, we talked daily. When I came back after the funeral and, and started playing again, it was, it really was. I mean, as the first day I got in the car and drove to the park, I was like, you know, I kind of felt like this, there's a little bit of a void there that this part of my day that's always been a part of my day wasn't there. For my dad to be able to be here to see um, to see me play and then just to experience the things that we experienced together knowing that um, you know he did he did get kind of get to see his dream in me it meant a lot to him it meant a lot to me Scott Brosius had two home runs in the American League Championship Series Yankee manager Joe Torre has faced struggles of his own. He missed the first 36 games this season, recovering from cancer surgery. Tonight, Torre has his Yankees in their third World Series in four years. Earlier, Jim Gray joined him in the dugout. All right, thank you very much, Hannah. I'm here with Joe Torre. Joe, the Braves have a pitching change. Glavin's out. Maddox is in. How does that change your lineup, and what does it do to the Yankees? Well, um, I got that news about uh, 3 o'clock this afternoon, and, and it just moves Ricky Lede in the left field. He was the only one that, you know, was a little startled because he had a feeling he wasn't playing against Glavin, even though I didn't put a lineup up there. But that, that's basically it. Otherwise, the lineup is pretty much the same. Turns Bernie around, and if there is maybe a shortcoming with the Yankees, they say maybe it is against left-handers. So do you feel maybe it is a bit of a break tonight to, to get this type of start instead of against uh, Glavin? He's going to find us sooner or later. Uh, the thing is, we, we don't have his bat in the lineup tonight, and, <laughs> and he's a pretty good hitter, so hopefully it works to our benefit. Well, the National League. You played in the National League. You managed in the National League. You've had some inter... Uh, league games this year, but how much more difficult is it to manage under National League rules tonight? Well, you have to pay attention. Uh, the, the one thing you don't want to do as a manager is run out of players. And, and you know, even though you, you're going to have to do that probably if you play a real long ball game, uh, but I, I think you just have to keep reminding yourself. I know I do, but I'm, I'm next to a pretty good guy in Zimmer who will make sure I don't forget that these are the rules we're playing under because sometimes you see that pitcher going up there in the on deck circle you say wait a minute where are you going uh, but you, you definitely have to be on your toes Jim especially in in regards to changing pitchers in the American League you don't have to make that decision but the National League you may want to force a guy through an extra uh, batter or two Joe good luck to you tonight thanks Jim all right let's go back upstairs to Hannah Thanks, Jim. And out in the Braves bullpen, Greg Maddox, who found out late last night that he would pitch game one against Torrey's Yankees, continues to warm up. Coming up next, we'll update the day in college football. But first, we continue our tradition of celebrating postseason heroes. Sun America NBC Sports Desk. Here's Hannah Storm. Back at Turner Field, we're moments away from game one of the 1999 World Series. But first, a quick check of the college football scoreboard, starting with second ranked Penn State visiting Purdue. And Purdue quarterback Drew Brees entering with impressive numbers. But it was the Nittany Lions defense that helped lead them to victory with two touchdowns. Defensive end Courtney Brown picking off Brees, scores from 25 yards out early in the second half to give Penn State a 14 point lead. The Nittany Lions go on to win it. 31 to 25, Penn State goes to 8 and 0. Welcome back to Atlanta. Time now for the player introductions. Here's Braves public address announcer Bill Bowers.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Turner Field for game one of the 1999 World Series between the American League champion New York Yankees and the National League champion Atlanta Braves. At this time, let's have a warm and loud welcome for the 1999 American League champion New York Yankees. of the Yankees is number six, Joe Torre. Here's tonight's starting lineup for the Yankees. Leading off, playing second base, number 11, Chuck Nabla. Playing shortstop, number two, Derek Jeter. Batting third, playing right field, number 21, Paul O'Neill. Batting fourth, playing center field, number 51, Bernie Williams. Batting fifth, playing first base, number 24, Tino Martinez. Batting sixth, in the bullpen, the catcher, number 20, Jorge Posada. Batting seventh, playing the field, number 17, Ricky Lede. Playing third base, number 18, Scott Brocious. And the pitcher in the bullpen, batting ninth, number 26, Orlando Hernandez. Field number 
33, Brian Jordan. Batting fifth, playing first base, number 18, Ryan Tesco. Playing center field, number 25, Andrew Jones. <laughs> Batting seven, in the bullpen, the catcher, number 12, Eddie Perez. Shortstop, number 22, Walt Weiss. And the pitcher, and the bullpen, batting ninth, number 31, Greg Maddox. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand. Kindly remove your caps for the presentation of colors, which will be presented tonight by Naval Air Station Atlanta. Also, at this time, cadets and staff from the Southeast Region Air Force ROTC are unfurling the flag in center field. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand. Kindly remove your caps and to honor America, join in the singing of our national anthem, which will be presented tonight by Grammy Award-winning Arista recording artist and hometown girl, Monica. and Joe Moore. 
Morgan will have the call of game one of the 1999 World Series next. This has been the E-Trade World Series pregame show. The 1999 World Series. Tonight, it's game one. The New York Yankees versus the Atlanta Braves. Just this past Tuesday night, this ballpark was the scene for the sixth and final game of a memorable National League Championship Series. Now we turn our attentions to the World Series, and we're joined by Joe Morgan. Joe, it seems strange to say that any team catches a break when they face Greg Maddox instead of the left-hander Tom Glavin, but statistically at least, the Yankees' best hitters do much better against right-handed pitching than left. Well, that's true, but the Braves starters are all interchangeable in that they could all be number one starters on any given day. But all things being equal, you would still rather th start a left-hander against the Yankees. And the reason for that is Jeter, O'Neill, and Williams, they're all better against right-handed pitching. So I think the Yankees catch a break here, if you want to call it that, because Greg Maddox is capable of shutting down anyone. But the key for Maddox tonight will be whether he can stay down in the strike zone and keep the right-handed hitters honest and keep them from leaning out over the plate. Here's something else that sounds strange to say about a four-time Cy Young Award winner, speaking of Maddox, and a certain Hall of Famer. He is a lesser postseason pitcher than his opponent tonight, Orlando Hernandez, who has had five postseason starts and has performed like Sandy Koufax or Bob Gibson. He's 4-0 in the postseason in his brief Major League career. And look at that microscopic ERA, 0.97. And the thing that makes him tough, Bob, is that he throws any pitch from any angle. And what he does to the right-handers, he drops down and hits the outside part of the plate. The key pitch for him is his changeup. He's falls in love with it every once in a while but that has become his best pitch and if he throws it for strikes tonight the Braves could have a problem Hernandez was 17 and 9 for the year Maddox was 19 and 9 let's go to our on field reporters beginning with Craig Sager Craig well Bob Tom Glavin never misses a start and I emphasize never but tonight he is bedridden for the stomach virus and the flu throughout his 11 year career has been more reliable than the courier neither rain nor sleep, nor hail, but in this case, neither a sore arm, nor bad knees, or broken ribs have ever kept him from missing a start. But in the team's best interest, he called Greg Max to make sure not only physically, but mentally he was prepared to pitch the opener. With that assurance, he called Bobby Cox, who said, stay in bed, keep away from your teammates, and get ready to pitch in New York. Now over to Bob. Jim Gray. All right, well, Louis Soho is not with the Yankees tonight. His father died in New Jersey on Thursday, and he has accompanied his body back to his home country of Venezuela for burial. Soho did call Joe Torre before the game and told him that he will be back in time for game three on uh, uh, Tuesday night in New York. Now, Soho was going to back up and replace Chuck Knobloch out in the field. Knobloch had been informed by Joe Torre back in game five at Boston for defensive purposes. But we spoke to Torre before the game, and Torre says now that in all likelihood, Knobloch will stay in the game through its entirety. Bob? Craig and Jim, thanks very much. Let's go to the Budweiser starting lineup for the New York Yankees. The top of the Yankee order, Knobloch and Jeter, has done a great job all season long setting the table for the middle of that order. Not so of the Atlanta Braves. When we look at their lineup, they have the lowest combined on base percentage for their first two hitters of any team in the National League. And the key for Greg Maddox, I said, is he'll have to keep the ball down in the strike zone, change speeds, move the ball in and out. He'll be relying a lot on his infield defense because he gets a lot of ground balls when he's throwing well. And Chipper Jones, 17 errors, led the Braves this year. But up the middle, Weiss and Boone and Andrew Jones, all very good defensive players. This is the first World Series ever between teams that played each other during the regular season. In July at Yankee Stadium, the Braves won two of three from the Yanks. Maddox to Knobloch, ball one. The plate umpire is the National League's Randy Marsh, Rocky Rowe of the American League at first, Steve Ripley from the National League at second, the American League's Darrell Cousins at third, Jerry Davis of the National League has the left field line, the American League's Jim Joyce is in right. That's a strike. 
for all of his greatness the four Cy Young Awards the four ERA titles Greg Maddox has only been a so so postseason pitcher his playoff and World Series combined record is ten and nine way high and this year Greg's control wasn't what it has been in the past in fact Greg gave up more hits than any other pitcher in the National League he gave up two hundred and fifty eight hits during the regular season his two one pitch is hit in the air to shallow right Jordan got a late break but he has time to get there that's what he has to do he threw the first couple of pitches away then he came in and jammed Knobloch because I think the Yankees are going to be looking for pitches away as we look at the scouting report relies on the movement with his fastball use this change up meaning he changes off the fastball it's not so much the change of speeds he just changes right off the fastball and when he gets ahead in the count he usually gets you to chase something out of the strike zone. Maddox split two decisions against the Yankees in the 96 World Series started against them in July at Yankee Stadium and was pummeled lasted just three and a third nine hits five runs. Jeter fouls the first one off. Derek's 349 average was second in the American League. Nomar Garcia Parra won the batting title at 357 for the Red Sox. High for a ball. The Yankees are well known for making pitchers go deep into counts, but Maddox is best known for getting ahead in the count. Strike one, strike two. That's the story with Maddox. Hit back up the middle, and Jeter is aboard. I don't think the Yankees will change their game plan the first time around through the order. I think they'll watch and see what Maddox does because they like to work the count. See the targets down and in, pitches up and out over the plate, and he rips it right back through the middle for a base hit. Derek Jeter has been hot the entire season, and I don't expect him to cool off here in the World Series. Now Paul O'Neill, whose broken rib is mending. He was playing hurt in the division series and the LCS. He is closer to 100% now. Bob, when you have a rib injury, it only hurts you when you swing and miss. If you make contact, you really do not feel the rib. Ball one to him. A year ago, Greg Maddox was 18 and 9. This year, 19 and 9. But in 98, his ERA was 2.22. This year, it's 3.57. So while he's still among the game's best, he's not quite as nearly invincible as he once was. This year, he had his fewest strikeouts in a decade, his fewest complete games in 12 years, his most home runs allowed since 1991. His 1 0 pitch to O'Neill, but first he chases Jeter back again. And that is the game plan of a lot of teams with Greg Maddox. Try to get your running game started. Make him conscious of the runners at first base. Greg in the past didn't pay a lot of attention to the runners at first. His concentration and focus was always on the hitters. And he gave up a lot of stolen bases. But here in the postseason, I see him giving a little more concentration to the runner at first base. Jeter's not going anywhere. O'Neill hits it to the opposite field, and Gerald Williams tucks it away. The throw almost got away on the return to the infield, but Klesko alertly is there to pick it up to keep Jeter from advancing. Well, it was a routine fly ball to left field. And here's Gerald Williams' throw back rather wide of second base but good back up there by Plesko. Gerald a little excited out in left field. Everybody's Everybody, a little excited. You're right. Everyone but you Bob. I know that you <laughs> were not that excited. You're just you're a normal set. If you don't have an extra adrenaline <laughs> rush when it comes time for the World Series they better check your pulse. Bob I think Bernie Williams is the key batter whether he's hitting left handed or right handed for this lineup he's the guy in the middle that keeps things going and at the top of the order you have Jeter and Knobloch who get on base a lot he becomes the guy I think for the Yankees if, and he hasn't had a good 
World Series the last couple of times out. So it'd be important for him to get off to a good start this year. In fact, in his two World Series, 96 and 98, Bernie Williams is five for 40. Last year, even though they swept the Padres, he had just one hit in the four games. And he takes a strike. If you're wondering about Maddox, moving up from game two to game one with the illness of Tom Glavin, he has plenty of rest. His last start was Sunday's game five of the LCS at Shea Stadium, so he's working on five days rest. He pitched seven innings in that game last Sunday. Inside corner, 0-2. Most of the people had success with Bernie Williams by staying away from him when he's hitting left-handed. Maddox goes away on the first pitch, but look at this. Fastball on the inside corner. That keeps him honest. And that's what you'll see from Greg Maddox. In, out, up, and down. A pitch out, but Jeter remains anchored at first. Good pitch out on that play. I thought he was going to. He got a good lead, and he may have read the pitch out. But the reason I say it was a good pitch out because you let the Yankees know that you will pitch out in certain situations when you're ahead in the count. Jeter stole 19 for the year. He was caught eight times. He goes on the one two pitch. Here's the throw from Perez. He steals it. Good move by Joe Torre I believe you send him because you have two strikes on Bernie Williams. And if he makes it, he's in scoring position. If he doesn't, you have Bernie Williams leading off. And you see Jeter got a great jump off of Maddox. And the throw wasn't that wasn't there nearly in time. Actually, a good pitch for Perez to throw on. He bounces it. But Jeter beats the throw anyway. As the count goes to two and two on Bernie Williams. Just missed the inside edge, and the count is full. Greg Maddox has his as his out pitch a lot of times against left-handed pitchers. He starts the ball off the plate inside, and then it moves back over the inside corner. Acts almost like a screwball. That one didn't get back enough. Bernie asks for time. Tino Martinez waiting on deck. All the arms in the Atlanta outfield are good arms, but Jeter runs very well, and with two outs, he'll be off with a crack of the bat. Good Slice pitch. foul. That was a good pitch by Maddox, and that's what they want to do. If they can stay away from Bernie Williams, they don't figure he's going to hurt them badly. And you keep him honest by going inside, as he did on the 2-2 pitch. Now this one is moving away, and you see a defensive swing here by Bernie Williams. He's not really attacking the ball. See, that's just a defensive swing because Maddox made a good pitch. And he struck him out to end the Yankee first. Busted him inside. Williams wanted to know if it was a strike. He swings and misses, and the Braves are coming up. As we look at the Atlanta lineup, for all of his success over his first two years in the major leagues, El Duque has not done well against the Braves. He has two career starts against them because of interleague play. As you see, Ryan Klesko has owned him. And Hernandez is 0-2 against the Braves with an ERA in those two games of 9.72. There you see the numbers for El Duque on the season. And the thing that makes him tough is that he runs the ball away from some left-handed hitters and then on them. He uses both sides of the plate, and he has an excellent change-up. And I think that's the key to his success, the change-up and staying down tonight. And we take a look at the defense behind him. Chuck Knobloch, 26 errors at second base. That's quite a few. Contrast that with 13 by Brett Boone of the Braves. And even further, Edgardo Alfonso of the Mets only made five. So right at the top and he's had a lot of problems with his throws he had 13 I think 14 errors on ground balls and 12 on throws so that's a little difficult there if the Yankees take a lead late in the game it had been Joe Torre's plan to replace Knobloch for defense with Luis Soho but Soho as we told you during the pregame show has returned home to Venezuela for his father's funeral the Yankees are without him for the first two games 
the commissioner denied their request to add a player to the roster under this special circumstance. So Torrey is playing with 24 men the first two games and expects Soho back on Tuesday at Yankee Stadium. Gerald Williams to start it. Ball one. Williams was in a one for 21 dive until he doubled off Kenny Rogers to start the 11th inning of game six Tuesday night and eventually scored the pennant winning run. A ball and a strike. I talked to Gerald before the ball game, Bob, and he says his team doesn't look at him like a leadoff hitter. They do not want him to go up and take a lot of strikes. They want him to jump start the offense by getting a base hit. So he is a little more aggressive than your normal leadoff hitter would be. He's a former Yankee. Dealt from the Bronx to Milwaukee in 1996, just before the good stuff started for the Yanks. Struck him out to start the Atlanta first. And El Duque gets him with a high slider away, sidearm. Let's take a look at the scouting report on El Duque. Throw a lot of different angles, slow curves to right-handers. And he's best when he's pitching inside to left-handed hitters. Klesko hit two home runs on breaking balls in Yankee Stadium. We'll see if he attacks him inside tonight. I think he has to throw the fastball inside to left-handed hitters. And a called strike to Brett Boone, who hit 252 for the season. A ball and a strike. There is some dispute, as we mentioned earlier in the playoffs, about Orlando Hernandez's actual age. He'd prefer to have you believe he's 30. Most folks say he's 34. One and two. But the key is, even though this is just his second year in the major leagues, he pitched in the biggest games in his native country of Cuba. He was the number one pitcher there for a long time. He pitched in playoff and championship games there. He's used to pitching when the pressure is on. He drops down sidearm and misses high. I thought Joe Buck put it well during the American League Championship Series. He said the guy who got off the boat and joined the Yankees was a finished product, not a rookie. And he begins the game with two strikeouts. When he throws from so many angles, it is very difficult to pick the ball up as quickly as you'd like as a hitter. And that's what is happening so far. He chased, had Gerald Williams chase the high slider out of the strike zone. He drops down to Boone and throws him a good fastball. Boone picks it up late, and he becomes a second strikeout victim. Now he has to deal with Chipper Jones. Chipper hit 45 home runs during the regular season, most ever by a switch hitter other than Mickey Mantle. He's yet to connect in the playoffs. <laughs> Foul back one and one. He hasn't hit a home run in one month, Bob. That was again, he hit a home run against the New York Mets. He hit four in the three-game series here. They had her in early September. It's interesting they're having a conversation here because if you're going to try to get Chipper Jones out with a fastball, usually you like to go inside. He left both pitches out over the plate. And I think he wants to talk to Posada about maybe throwing him a few change-ups or something off speed just to see how he reacts. Chipper's two for five in his career with a homer against El Duque. Just off the outside corner, two and one. It's a chilly night here, 49 degrees. Wind chill 31. Inside three and one. October 23rd is the latest start date ever for the World Series. Risk wind blowing, as you can see. Jones sitting on a 3 1 pitch and fouling it back. There has never been a World Series game played later than October 28th. If this one goes seven, the last game is scheduled for Halloween. The payoff pitch. He struck out the side. Williams and Boone swinging. 
Chipper Jones looking. A shot of Centennial Park from the Goodyear Blimp. Stars and Stripes based in Pompano Beach, Florida. At the controls is pilot Dick Esch. This ballpark, of course, was the Olympic Stadium before being converted for baseball to Turner Field. The last time these teams met in the World Series in 1996, they were the last baseball games played at Fulton County Stadium. The Yankees won all three of them. They dropped the first two at Yankee Stadium, then came south and won games three, four, and five. Tino Martinez against Maddox. The Yankees, in fact, have an eight game World Series winning streak going. The last four in 96 and then four straight a year ago against the Padres. Two and up. Down low and Maddox falls behind Martinez three balls and no strikes and Bob if you're a Braves fan maybe it's a good omen that Greg Maddox starts tonight. He started in 95 to when they won their world championship he beat Cleveland three to two on opening night. He walks Martinez on four pitches to start the Yankee second. Very unusual for Maddox especially to a leadoff hitter. But you can see he threw a lot of pitches or with a lot of movement. I think he was trying to get Martinez to chase one and he wouldn't. A lot of movement on those three first three fastballs he threw. And this is un Maddox like as well. 11 strikes and nine ba balls in 20 pitches. First one to Posada, a double play ball to Boone. He flips to Rice for one, on to first, and they turn it 4-6-3. When Maddox is at his best, he gets a lot of ground balls. And he will always get you the ground ball when he has runners on base. That's how he comes out of any jam that he might find himself in early in the ball game. See that ball sinking down and away? Posada tries to pull it. Perfect 4-6-3. to six to three. So you throw four bad ones to Martinez but one good one to Posada takes care of the mess. Here's the left fielder Ricky Lede. As a rookie last year he went six for ten including three doubles in the World Series against San Diego. He would not have played tonight had Glavin started Chad Curtis would have been in left. A high fly ball, shallow left field. Williams in and toward the line to complete the New York second. No score after one and a half. Game one. Very few Braves games during the course of a season are played in weather conditions like this. It's downright cold for game one. Ryan Jordan, Ryan Klesko, Andrew Jones in the bottom of the second against Orlando Hernandez, who struck out the side in the first. And Bob, a scouting report that they give you on a pitcher sometimes can hurt you the first time through the order. I guarantee you they told them that El Duque throws a lot of curveballs and changeup. He came right out with the fastball and retired three straight hitters, struck them all out. He's used his fastball more than they probably said he would in the scouting report. And he falls behind Jordan 3 and 0. In the Monday LCS clincher at Fenway Park, Hernandez threw 138 pitches, his highest pitch count of the season. Working tonight on four days rest. Called strike 3 and 1. And he doesn't want to walk Jordan leading off the inning because Ryan Klesko is next and he's had a lot of success against El Duque. You deal an understatement, my friend. <laughs> five for five with two home runs. The 3 1. Hit in the air to right center field. O'Neill for the catch. Number 
Here's a look at some of the damage Ryan Plesko did at Yankee Stadium off El Duque. As Joe mentioned earlier, both were curveballs, and he jumped on them. And we'll see how he pitches him here in this ballpark. Down low for a ball. I'm reminded with Paul O'Neill making the catch on Brian Jordan's line drive. The last ball he caught in the postseason in Atlanta ended game five of the 96 World Series. Out of play with runners at first and third in the bottom of the ninth of a one nothing game in the series tied 2 2. John Wetland trying to finish it and Luis Polonia smacked one to right and O'Neill made a fine running catch to end the game and send the Yankees home with a 3 2 lead. Then they won game six. Two balls and a strike. One thing that El Duque is doing very well tonight is using both sides of the plate, whether it be for a left handed hitter or a right handed hitter. And Klesko hits it deep to right, but not deep enough. O'Neill will take it. And that's the pitch that he needs to be effective against left handed pitching. Fastball in, and he jams Klesko. Hides the ball very well, three quarters, and he gets in on his hands. It was in a good location almost for Plesko, but not quite out on the plate enough, and he jammed him. And O'Neill is able to make the catch. First time Hernandez has ever retired Plesko. Now he faces Andrew Jones and starts him with ball one. in there Jones is homerless in the postseason after hitting 26 in the regular year two of them in July at Yankee Stadium he lays off they want to check it first and no he didn't go around one of the things that Jones wants to do is make sure he gets a good pitch to hit a strike he will go out of the zone a lot of the times that pitch is out of the strike zone but he's able to check he drops down sidearm and Jones fouls it back. Now the 2 2. And that'll make the seats. And that's what the Yankees will try to get Jones to do is go out of the strike zone. That pitch was up and out of the strike zone, but. Jones with two strikes chases it. El Duque throwing a lot of fastballs. I mentioned this one's up out of the zone. You see Andrew takes a hack at it. And he hangs in there at two and two. With nobody on base, Orlando Hernandez is working at a much brisker pace than we usually see him work. But when he gets in a jam, he's very deliberate. Another foul. Hernandez with that very distinctive scissor kick delivery. He kicks that left leg so high he could plant a kiss on his knee if he wanted to. <laughs> that helps him to hide the ball, especially from right handed hitters. Good battle between Hernandez and Jones. When he kicks up real high to watch, this is what the hitter sees. Nothing but knees. That's all you see as a hitter. You can't find the ball. And it lets him hide the ball a long time, and you only find it once he gets it out in front of him. Another 2-2 pitch. Full count to Andrew Jones. Just as it was on Tuesday night when his patience paid off and he got the pennant winning walk from Kenny Rogers straight over the top curveball overhand curveball something he doesn't throw very often to right handed hitters he'll do that to left handed hitters but not very often will he throw a left hander I mean a right hander an overhand curveball. Here's the tenth pitch of Andrew Jones at bat. 
And Jones wins the battle, drawing a two-out walk. And that was a very good at bat for Jones in that he showed the Yankees that he, he's going to have more patience here in the World Series than maybe had throughout the season. And Don Baylor has talked to him all during the season. Hey, you need to be more patient. Make them give you a pitch to hit. Don Baylor's also credited with Chipper Jones hitting for more power from the right side. He said he's made him more aggressive, swinging a little harder, and getting better results from the right side. And all these Atlanta hitters will be without Baylor next year. He'll have his choice from at least a few offers to manage. Cubs, Brewers, Angels, Indians, all said to have at least some interest in Don Baylor. Now Eddie Perez, the MVP of the National League Championship Series, he went 10 for 20 with two home runs against the Mets. This after a 249 regular season with just seven homers. El Duque works at holding runners tight because, you know, when he has his high leg kick, you feel like you can steal a lot of bases on him. But he actually releases the ball pretty quickly to the plate, and he concentrates on keeping you close at first base. Jones gets back. Among the Yankee starters, only Andy Pettit is truly effective at holding runners, and he has one of the best pickoff moves in the majors. Pettit is the starter for game three. And the Braves did have a lot of success against the Mets in the LCS. <laughs> Look at his eyes. 18 for 22. He bluffs the go, and time was called before the delivery. One of the things that El Duque will do to stifle the runners at first base is he'll hold the ball a little longer. And when you do that, sometimes the hitter gets anxious, and that's why Perez called timeout. But he varies his delivery time he'll hold it one time next time up he'll just go right to the pit his chest and throw the ball to the plate. Now he comes home and it's up and in. There was a time when Eddie Perez was just known as Greg Maddox's personal catcher. Javi Lopez was the regular otherwise but then at midseason Lopez went down with a knee injury and Perez became the regular guy. American League Championship Series MVP delivering to the NLCS MVP. And a called strike, one and one. Perez is 31 years old, spent nine years in the minors before being called up in 1995. He's never gone back. Game of cat and mouse with Andrew Jones edging away from first. Not going, and Perez is way out in front, one and two. This is the pitch that El Duque is famous for. He drops down and throws a sidearm breaking ball, and Perez just chases it. Way out in front, and the ball is way off the plate. That's a very deceptive pitch if you're a right-handed hitter. Here's the one two and time again was called at the last instant and Hernandez very upset with this one because he felt like he didn't hold it as long as he did before and he was about to release the ball and that the umpire called timeout rather late. As we told you as soon as someone gets on base El Duque's pace becomes about as deliberate as any pitcher in the major leagues. One two pitch hit deep to left down the line and in the seats foul. Let's take a look at this last pitch El Duque dropping down a lot on Perez that ball's caught the outside corner Perez hits it down the line but it goes foul. If you're a base runner any time a pitcher drops down to throw sidearm he gives you a little more time to run than he does when he throws from three quarters. And another one two pitch but first Jones has to dive back again. Andrew Jones on the brink of stardom. Still only 22 years old, leads away from first with two out. 
not going. And Perez goes down on strikes. The fourth K put in the book through two innings of work by El Duque. No score after two at Turner Field. Welcome back, Jim Gray. Not in Hotlanta tonight. You're looking at a heater in the Yankee dugout. Turner Field doesn't have any heaters. They've never needed any heaters. But it's below freezing with the wind chill factor tonight. So this afternoon, the superintendent of uh, Turner Field went out and rented a bunch of heaters tonight. They didn't want to buy them because they don't feel they'll ever need them again. But the weather forecast, Bob, is for cold temperatures again tomorrow, and they certainly need them tonight. Up to you. Jim, thanks a lot. A ball and a strike to Brocious. Well, everything has its price. When you expand the playoffs without shortening the regular season, when all the games are played at night for a larger primetime audience, you're going to get some games played under weather conditions as you move to late October that are less than ideal. Hit toward the hole, an opposite field single for Brocious to start the Yankee third. It's a high fastball from Maddox, and we talked earlier his need to stay down in the strike zone. This is a high fastball. Brocious, good high fastball hitter. Goes the other way with it. Good hitting there by Brocious. And now up comes El Duque, who of course seldom bats, being in the American League, but an interleague play this year. He was one for three. The one hit was an infield single. We'll see how good a bunter he is. He squares and gets it down in front of the plate. Chipper Jones picks it up. Good sacrifice by Hernandez. Well, you wouldn't want to teach your young players to butt like this. He kind of stabs at it, but it makes a good stab, and he gets the job done. And watch this. He kind of stabs at it. That's not the way you butt. You stick the bat out, try to catch it, but any way to get the job done, and El Duque does the job. In a sacrifice situation, isn't it true, Joe? You're supposed to almost be pulling the bat back toward yourself slightly, like you're catching catch the ball to catch. deaden it on the bunt. Yeah, you're supposed to try to catch the ball on the barrel of the bat and kind of punch at it. But again, if it works, we're not arguing with the results. So Brocious is in scoring position with one out. Here's Knobloch, who fly to right to start the game. On the first pitch, he chops one foul. Behind the bag, Klesko gloved it, but a foul ball. Let's take a look at Knobloch here. He gets a high fastball, as Brocious did. Tries to go the other way, but he gets it foul. Pitch again up from Maddox. Knobloch late on it. Hits fair and bounces foul before it gets to first base. Knobloch, the 91 American League Rookie of the Year with the Twins, played on the Minnesota team that beat the Braves in the World Series that fall. Foul to the seats. When you talk about this team of the decade stuff, you have to take it with a grain of salt. It's really about franchise of the decade. Only two Braves remain from their first World Series team in 91, Glavin and Smoltz. And in fact, there are only seven Atlanta Braves even left from the team three years ago that lost to the Yankees and only 12 Yankees return from that world championship team of 96. A line at a center Andrew Jones closing ground on it makes the catch. So maybe the mythical trophy should go to the organization of the decade, huh? Well, I, I think that's basically what you're saying is that it's the franchises themselves that have kept these teams at the top of their game. But the one thing to remember about the Braves is that the nucleus of their ball club is still together, and it's always been their pitching staff, their starting pitchers. And Maddox, Glavin, Smoltz, and one time Steve Avery. If the question is sustained excellence, it's already case closed. Right. The team of the decade is the Atlanta Braves, but the Yankees have a chance to win their third world title in four years and to do it twice at Atlanta's expense. Here's Jeter, single and stole a base in the first. Well, do you measure it by games won in the decade or do you measure it by championships won? And I think that that's the, the key. Jeter single on a fastball out over the plate in the first inning Maddox tried to get that fastball in on him and he fouls it out of play 
Brocious at second with two down. That one's low, a ball and a strike. When Jeter first came up, he would swing at a lot of bad pitches. He chased pitches, especially up and in, low and away off the plate. Now he makes sure he gets a good pitch to hit every time he goes to the plate. That's how you hit 349. One of the three great shortstops gracing the American League now. You can throw in Omar Vizquel at a different stage of his career, especially for the glove, but I'm thinking Garcia Para, Rodriguez, and Jeter. Fastball up and in, two and one. That was a purpose pitch. He wanted to throw that fastball tailing in. To let Jeter know that he can't lean out over the plate. Because Maddox feels probably that his best pitch is a sinker away from Jeter if he wants to get him out. Like that. Bouncing ball to Boone. As sure handed as they come and he throws him out. To the bottom of the third. No one's broken through yet in game one. Number 22. Looking around Turner Field. It's 335 down the line and left, 380 to the gap in left center, 400 to straightaway center field, deeper to right center, 390, and 330 down the line and right. Generally speaking, the ball carries pretty well from the lines toward the gaps, but from gap to gap, it does not carry well here at all. Walt Weiss starts it in the bottom of the third, and that one floats in there for strike one. That second inning included a 10 pitch battle with Andrew Jones who waited him out for a walk. Hence the total of 24. He gets ahead of Weiss 0 and 2. That's the pitch that makes him so effective against left handed pitching. The fastball in because you have to be conscious of that pitch and then he throws you a slow curve or a change up away and you're automatically a little bit out in front because you're protecting against the inside fastball. One and two. Weiss hit just 226 during the regular season. A bit better than that in the playoffs. And he's a good glove man. Jose Hernandez and Ozzy Guillen are among those on their bench, both of whom can play shortstop. Two and two. Both Ozzy Guillen and Jose Hernandez contributed. To the Braves LCS championship. Hernandez with a big pinch hit in game six. Got him looking for his fifth strikeout. Let's take a look at the pitch sequence here that he uses to walk wise. A good overhand slow curve, fastball in on the hands. That opens up the outside. He misses. Stays out there again. Now here's the strike three pitch. That's a beautiful curveball right around the knees. A ball to Maddox, who's always been a good hitter. He's had higher averages than this year's 172. But perhaps taking his own advice from the commercial that chicks dig the long ball, <laughs> he went deep twice this year. him only 60 plus behind McGuire and Sosa. Fouled off two and two. Joe Torre says that Orlando Hernandez reminds him of Juan Marichal the great Dominican right hander for the San Francisco Giants with the wide repertoire of pitches and the command of all of them. Some guys can throw five or six different pitches, but they can only throw two or three of them for strikes. Not so with El Duque. Then when you throw in the deceptive delivery and the various arm angles, he's a nightmare, especially for right-handed hitters. I guess that missed, but I don't see how. Full count. Well, El Duque started his walk toward the dugout. He thought it was strike three. 
That would have truly been premature though. Since there's only one out here's the three two. Well he finishes him with the next one. He struck out six of the first nine hitters he's faced. And folks you can log on to MSNBC Sports .com as the Reds Barry Larkin provides constantly updated analysis of the key plays and strategy in tonight's game. You can also exchange email with Barry during the game and access total cast for a real time box score and visual graphic on the location of each pitch. MSNBC Sports .com, the official website of NBC Sports. Williams bluffs the bunt and takes the strike. Exchange email with Barry Larkin. Dear Barry, do you like Cincinnati? Do you stay there in the offseason? Where are you staying in Atlanta? Strike two. Bob El Duque is throwing much better tonight than what we saw him throw in the opening game of the division series against the Texas Rangers. He is very sharp tonight. Is he ever? He strikes out the side for the second time in three innings. Seven for the game. El Duque, razor sharp through his first three innings of work. Hasn't allowed the Braves a hit. Only one man has reached. Andrew Jones had a walk in the second. And he struck out seven. Greg Maddox set to face Paul O'Neill, Bernie Williams, and Tino Martinez in the fourth. Tomorrow night before game two here at Turner Field, they'll unveil the all century team as selected by a fan vote, supplemented by some additional selections from a panel of experts. O'Neill fouls it off. Greg Maddox just missed making that team. He was just beneath the cutoff in the fan vote. Roger Clemens, who with five Cy Youngs has one more than Maddox, and who will start game four at Yankee Stadium for the Yanks. There he is. Clemens is on the all century team. Threw it by O'Neill upstairs, 0 and 2. Well, he threw a fastball away, and I think, watch O'Neill, see if he starts out to get another fastball away. So he starts out there, and then Maddox releases the high fastball in, way out of the strike zone. Unusual for O'Neill, he doesn't swing at that many bad pitches. He flied to left his first time up. Beautiful. And Maddox dispatches him on three pitches. Well, that's the screwball-like fastball we talked about earlier. He tried it on. Bernie Williams in the first inning and wasn't successful. Now watch where this ball starts. It starts, it's way off the plate. Look at that, it's way inside. Then all of a sudden, look at it, it starts to move back toward the inside part of the plate. Beautiful pitch there. And that's the pitch that he uses so effectively against left-handed hitters. O'Neill not happy. He, of course, familiar with Maddox from all of his years in the National League. And then there have been interleague games the past couple of years and the World Series of 96. Want to know to Bernie Williams who struck out to end the first and he steps out of the box. Two balls and no strikes. Bernie Williams is a very streaky type hitter. When he gets in a streak I mean he's very difficult to get out. So I think it's very important for the Braves to try to keep him down at least the first couple of ball games before he gets to Yankee Stadium because he's the key to their offense. He rips the 2 0 pitch into the glove of Ryan Klesko. That was blistered, but Klesko was right there. And the good part, though, if you're the Braves, watch where the pitch is. Maddox keeps the ball down, which is what he wants to do. He gets this pitch up, and Bernie Williams probably would have hit it out of the ballpark. Gets the ball down, and he hits a line drive. If you're Maddox, you don't really care about the line drive. See, that ball's down, so he doesn't get it in the air. Nice play there by Klesko. How much does a scorcher like that sting on a night like this, as well, chilly as it is? It would hurt more if you were a regular fielder. He's got a big web in that glove. Oh, well, that's <laughs> <first> true. Base. <laughs> He's not using that little mitten no. that you used to use at second base. <laughs> or any other infielder. But that's, look at that big web. It's got plenty of room in there. 
the 1 0 pitch to Tino Martinez. Goes the opposite way. Gerald Williams retreating, not quite to the track to take it. Maddox makes quick work of the Yankees in the fourth. Terrific duel shaping up between Maddox and El Duque. Again, the view from the Goodyear Blimp Stars and Stripes. Goodyear currently maintains a fleet of seven blimps, three domestic and four international operations. And a look at the way El Duque has been operating in the postseason. He is hanging out now with some of the great names in baseball history, including his own teammate, Mariano Rivera, but all of that is out of the bullpen, of course. That's his updated career ERA, 0 0.90 in the postseason. A fraction better than Sandy Koufax. But of course, all of Koufax's postseason appearances were World Series games only. El Duque has the Division Series, the LCS, and now the Fall Classic. One and one to Brett Boone. And Bob, the first game we saw him pitch in postseason this year was against the Texas Rangers. He got by that night on just his guile and knowing how to pitch. Tonight, he's not only getting by with his guile, but he has great stuff. He's got a great fastball that's live and moving. He has a very sharp curveball. In fact, he's throwing fewer changeups than you expect because he has such good stuff. He has such a good live fastball. He's not using his changeup nearly as much as you anticipate. And he fans Brett Boone for the second time tonight. He's faced 11 hitters, and eight of them have struck out. Let's go to Craig Sager. Well, the Braves are now the second time around in the order against Hernandez. Like a basketball coach during a timeout, hitting coach Don Baylor huddled each one up and went over what happened the first time they were up. And as Joe Morgan pointed out, it was fastballs. Chipper looked at a fastball for strike three. Don Baylor said, take some pitches, make some adjustments, Bob. First one to Chipper down and in. Perhaps it's not too early to mention the World Series record for strikeouts in a game. 17 Bob Gibson in 1968 for the Cardinals Chipper Jones gets under one it's a question of fair or foul down the line Gone. the first hit off El Duque is Chipper Jones first home run of this postseason and Bobby did make an adjustment. Remember the first time up, he struck him out with a fastball in. He had set him up better. But what does Chip Jones do? He looks for a fastball in. That's where a hitting instructor is so valuable, telling you to go up there and make adjustments to how they got you out the first time up. And Chipper made an adjustment and drilled the fastball out of the ballpark. A towering fly ball. And a 1-0 Atlanta lead. Strike one to Brian Jordan. Exactly a month since he last touched one off. Brian Jordan who once played for Yankee manager Joe Torre in St. Louis fly to right his first time up two and one it's always interesting to see how a pitcher reacts after a guy hits a home run Brian Jordan drives one to right Paul O'Neill is back there to take it. Another look at the ball that Chipper Jones jacked out of here. And remember, he struck him out with a fastball inside the first time up. He goes inside again, even though he wasn't supposed to. And Chipper Jones ready for the fastball inside, and he's able to keep it fair down the right field line. And he gives the Braves a one-to-nothing lead. Now Ryan Klesko. Who fly to right in the second. Broken bat comebacker. El Duque to Martinez. But the Braves are on the board first. Chipper Jones, the likely National League MVP, gives them a 1-0 lead after four. It sounded good. It looked good. It's on the board. 1-0 Atlanta.
Maddox staked to a slim 1-0 lead as we go to the fifth. Posada, Lede, and Brocious do for the Yankees. Hard to imagine the Atlanta Braves winning this World Series without a major contribution from Chipper Jones. They got by the Astros and the Mets without Jones doing the sort of thing he did throughout the regular season. He homers in his second at bat of this game. The bat is shattered. Boone scoops it up. Posada's retired. Bob, this is what happens when pitchers make mistakes to good hitters. The pitch is supposed to be outside. Watch where it is. Inside. Chipper drills it down the line, and for a moment there, it looked like it might go foul. As you see the ball there, but it stays on the fair side of the pole, and it's a home run. Now watch El Duque. He says, my fault. My fault. I was supposed to get the fastball away. I got it in. And that's what happens when you make good mistakes against good hitters. Six umpires in postseason play. Jim Joyce of the American League on the right field line, right on top of it to make the close call, but the correct call. Ricky Lede with a mile high pop. Weiss, the wind's playing with it to the middle of the diamond, and finally he makes a one handed catch. A swirling wind made that an adventure. Well, we saw that earlier in the ball game. The wind is coming in. Looks like it's moving from the foul pole in left field towards the foul pole in right, but it must be swirling a lot on the infield. You see, Weiss thought it was going to be well out there on the infield dirt, and he ends up running in by the pitcher's mound, and he makes the catch. That was a big league pop up, and the wind made it more difficult. Two quick outs. Here's Brocious, who poked a single to right his first time up. Brocious, last year's World Series MVP. Had a huge postseason overall, batted nearly 400 with four homers. Came back to earth a bit this year, 247 with 17 home runs. Last year was the season of his life. He hit 300 and knocked in almost 100. One and two. And the one thing you have to notice with Greg Maddox tonight is that he has not thrown any curveballs and only a couple of sliders. He's throwing the fastball and changing speeds on the fastball. That one's up the middle for a base hit, the second of the night for Scott Brocious. Another fastball that he got up, not exactly where he wanted to throw it. And Brocious with two strikes grounded back <laughs> through the middle for a base hit. <laughs> But if you watch, he's just not throwing very many curveballs. See, that's a fastball he wants to start off the plate and sink out there, but it didn't sink. It was up, and, he, and Brocious does a good job of grounding it back through the middle. Now watch Maddox. He's won gold gloves almost ever since he's been here in Atlanta, and he just barely misses that ball. And if nothing else, it accomplishes this. It gets Hernandez out of the way and gets them to the top of the order for the sixth inning. Maddox, as a matter of fact, has won nine consecutive gold gloves. Quickly ahead of El Duque, 0 and 2. We asked Joe Torre about Hernandez as a hitter. He described him as a whale and bail guy. <laughs> I guess you bail first and whale second. He bails, he wails, he pokes it to second, Boone flips it to first, and the Yankees are done in the fifth. The Chipper Jones home run has Maddox and the Braves in front, 1-0. The Braves won 103 games during the regular season. The Yankees, after the tremendous year in 98, when they won 114, and 125 if you count the postseason slipped if you can call it that to 98 regular season wins but they clearly were the two best teams in their respective leagues and now they meet in a much anticipated World Series one nothing Braves bottom of the fifth game one Andrew Jones to face Hernandez called strike one Andrew walked his first time up.
The nickname El Duque means, as you might guess, even if you don't speak Spanish, the Duke. Hit hard, but right into the glove of Brocious, who snares it at third. It's a breaking ball that he leaves in the middle of the plate. He hasn't done this very often, and Andrew Jones rips it, but right at the third baseman, Brocious. Brocious, very good third baseman. He's ready for that one. Here's Eddie Perez. Ground ball foul. Orlando Hernandez is actually the second El Duque. The first was his father, Arnaldo, who was, according to those in the know, kind of a middling player, pitched some, played some infield in Cuba. You see him directing traffic out there. He's telling the infield to move over because I thought they were way off the line for a guy like Perez when they're going to throw him a lot of breaking balls and change ups. And El Duque said, hey, move over a little bit. Brocia still didn't move, but. <laughs> Owen oh, 2 to Perez. El Duque has some real presence about him. He's a charismatic guy. He's got that distinctive style. He's a high kicking, high pants wearing son of a gun. The circumstances of how he got to the States defecting the day after Christmas in 97, his background in Cuba, the fact that he doesn't have a full command of English yet, which keeps a distance between him and some of his teammates, it all adds to the mystique that surrounds him. Perez stays alive. When you mentioned the mound presence, I thought about the other Cuban born pitchers who are pitched in the Major League Camilio Pasquale, Louis Tiant, Mike Cuellar, and his brother Levon. All of them have a special presence when they stand on the mound. I mean, they, they, you keep your eyes on them the entire ball game. And Perez strikes out for the second time, and that's nine in four and two thirds for Hernandez. Tomorrow night, you're not going to want to miss the World Series pregame at 7.30 Eastern as NBC Sports and MasterCard bring you the all-century team ceremony. Hank Aaron, Ted Williams, Willie Mays, they'll be among the living legends in attendance for that ceremony. The MasterCard all-century team tomorrow during the World Series pregame, 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific, only on NBC. And the Strike hammer, one. Hank Aaron, will throw out the first pitch. And the biggest ovation should be his. It'll be interesting to see what kind of reception Pete Rose receives. I think it'll be overwhelmingly positive. I think it would have to be since he was voted on the team by the fans. So I think that, yep. you know, most of the fans must have felt that he deserved to be here. He was ninth among the nine outfielders voted in by the fans. A tenth, Stan Musial, was added by the panel, somehow overlooked in the fan voting. What an outrage it would have been if Stan the Man was excluded. One and two to Walt Weiss. That one missed, two and two. 17 or 18 of the 30 members of the All-Century team are living. They are all expected to be here for what should be a goosebump raising ceremony prior to game two. Two out, nobody on. Braves lead at one nothing in the last of the fifth. And a chopper down to Martinez. Covering is El Duque, and he works a perfect fifth inning. Back to Turner Field after this. Well, with Luis Soho unavailable for the first two games, Don Zimmer, who was an infielder, perhaps getting ready just in case they need him, or perhaps for luck, doing what he always does with Derek Jeter's bat in an inning in which Derek is scheduled to hit. He saw him hand it to the Yankee shortstop as he walked by. Jeter's on deck as Knobloch starts it in the sixth. Ball one from Maddox. And a lot of little things have an effect on the outcome of a ball game. Last inning we saw Brocious get a base hit on two strikes that allowed Hernandez to bat and now you have the top of your order up here in the sixth inning and that's exactly the way you set your lineup up because that's what you want. But very rarely does a leadoff hitter get a chance to lead off an inning other than the first inning. 
Joe Torre who of course managed in the National League with the Mets with these Braves with the Cardinals. Broken back ground ball backhanded by Chipper Jones across the diamond to get that one. Interesting change of strategy there by Maddox. I talked about the fact he hadn't been throwing many breaking balls but he throws two here in this at bat. There you see that's a curveball from him to Chuck Knobloch. Knobloch pulls it. Chipper Jones near the line because he knows the breaking ball is coming. He's able to backhand it and to throw across the diamond to retire Knobloch for out number one. Jones had some problems with the glove earlier in the playoffs. Nice play there. Here's Jeter who's one for two. The Yankees have three hits against Maddox. The Braves have only one off El Duque but it was a fourth inning homer by Chipper Jones. Tap foul a ball and a strike and you see the adjustment that Maddox has made he's throwing more breaking balls now. Most of the guys are going up there looking fastball change up. Now he's starting to throw more breaking balls. Jeter out in front. Fastball in on his hands, and Maddox gets ahead of him one and two. That was a great pitch there. It looked like that ball really started to chase Jeter. He had to swing at it or get hit. Watch this pitch. The ball, watch the rotation. Look at the it's turning in and just running in on his hands. He has to fight it off just to keep it from hitting him. Which opens up the outside corner, of course. Two and two. One of the perplexing things about facing Maddox is that he will throw any pitch on any count. Such is his command of his entire repertoire. The 2-2 two -two to Jeter. Struck him out looking. And the fastball that chased him was the one that set that pitch up there. Let's take a look at the pitch sequence. Fastball he fought with a strike off the plate way inside just off the plate Now watch this just on the outside corner. Anytime you throw a fastball in and you jam a hitter the hitter always tries to protect against that pitch coming in there again and that always opens up the outside part of the plate and no one does it better than Greg Maddox. O'Neill has flied out and struck him. And our scouting report on Maddox says he uses a lot of movement with his fastball because that's his main pitch. And all you have to do is just watch at home. You can see the movement on every pitch that he throws. Down low 2 and 0. Oh. Derek Jeter still trying to figure out what Maddox did to him. Derek you have lots of company. He's had hitters shaking their heads for a decade. Two and one to O'Neill. And you can just see the movement on that pitch. Watch where this pitch starts. It looks like a good pitch to hit. Starts to look like it's almost in the middle of the plate. Now watch the movement. It just really dives away at the last minute, and O'Neill ends up swinging at a bad pitch. It's the late movement on so many of his pitches that's really a key. Called strike, perfect place on the corner, two and two. You know, it seems like Maddox has been around forever, yet he's only 33, and he's already won 221 career games, so he's got a shot at 300 before his career is over. Control like that is what's made him the pitcher he's been. O'Neill just taps it weakly. Maddox picks it up. He'll tag it himself, and he works a perfect sixth. To the bottom half, still one nothing. Greg Maddox has a way of frustrating you as a hitter. Paul O'Neill, not a good swing, chops the ball down the first baseline. Now watch, Maddox comes over to tag him and watch O'Neill's left elbow. He shoots it out, and I think O'Neill's saying here, hey, throw the ball to first base, don't tag me. A little frustration there from being dominated by Maddox in that at bat. 
think a lot of hitters would have done that though. You don't like to have a pitcher come over and tag you as you're running to first base. Here is Maddox at the plate. One and one the count to him. All of the Atlanta starting pitchers are such good hitters that they were vying to work the first two games so that they get a chance to bat. You go to Yankee Stadium with the DH and the bat is taken out of the pitcher's hands. I'm not so sure that Maddox wants to run up there against El Duque <laughs> though because he's dropping down and throwing an assortment of breaking balls. I'm not so sure Ted Williams <laughs> yeah. would want to run up there although at least he hits left handed. Maybe DiMaggio would be the better example. He's so tough on right handed hitters coming up on NBC. <laughs> Monday, it's NBC's second great Law & Order series. Critics call it something special. How? Gripping and well-made. Don't miss an all-new Law & Order special victims unit. NBC Monday. The strikeout of Maddox was the 10th for El Duque. We're just in the 6th, and with one out, the hitter is Gerald Williams, who has fanned both times. Can't catch up with the fastball. Well he's been able to drill the outside part of the plate with the fastball and if you're a right handed hitter when he drops down you automatically give a little bit and that opens up the outside corner for him. From the sidearm angle a little chopper up the line and now it's Hernandez's turn to tag the batter runner. That was a good play by Hernandez because if he catches it and tries to throw over Gerald Williams he may hit him as he's running down the line so this shows how good an athlete Hernandez is. He feels his position well, but he's a great athlete. Watch this chopper. Watch out. immediately. He's off after the ball. This ball was going to go foul, but he doesn't let it go foul. He grabs it, then he makes the tag. And watch this. this ball would have gone foul right here if he wouldn't have gotten to it so quickly. And Gerald Williams tries to avoid the tag, and you see El Duque put a two-hand tag on him. Both of tonight's pitchers are truly excellent fielders. They become, in effect, a fifth infielder after the delivery. I was speaking the other day with Roberto Gonzalez Echeverria, who is the Sterling Professor of Spanish and Portuguese Literature, Portuguese Literature at Yale, who wrote the book, the definitive book on Cuban baseball called The Pride of Havana. And he tells me that on a night like this in Cuba, many residents will fashion their own antennas to try to pull in the telecast of the game. And they'll certainly be listening to it on the radio. That this ball game tonight with El Duque working is the number one focus of interest on the island of Cuba, the baseball mad island of Cuba. Brett Boone fouls it back. He has struck out in each of his first two at bats, and now he's in an 0-2 hole. So much for El Duque being a warm weather pitcher, Bob. He pitched a great game against Cleveland in the cold weather last year, and he's pitching a great game tonight in the cold weather. Waste that one high and away. The Yankees were trailing two to one in that ball in that series with Cleveland last year, and I thought his game was the most important game of the Yankee season. Did Boone check his swing? He did. Posada was already trotting off. But it's two and two. Well let's take a look. Watch the barrel of the bat. Don't watch his hands. Just watch the barrel of the bat. And you can see he kept the barrel under control. He pokes this one to short. Jeter's got it. And throws him out. Six innings quickly gone by in game one and a one nothing Atlanta lead. With Joe Morgan Bob Costas back at Turner Field if you're just joining us Tom Glavin was scratched from his scheduled starting assignment in game one with a stomach virus. Greg Maddox moved up a day and what a duel he's involved with with Orlando Hernandez one nothing as we go to the seventh. Well any of the Braves starters can be the number one you know pitcher on any staff they're on. So the fact that Greg Maddox started in place of Glavin the only difference is one is left handed the other is right handed but they're very similar in their approach to pitching. They basically both use the outside corner very well.
Ernie Williams will start it followed by Tino Martinez and Jorge Posada in the seventh Warren Spahn a member of the all century team threw out the first pitch at tonight's game Braves fans going back to Milwaukee and Yankee fans at least those who have reached middle age or beyond will recall that in 1957 Warren Spahn was scheduled to pitch the seventh and deciding game of the World Series at Yankee Stadium. He turned up ill and was replaced by Lou Burdett who on two days rest stepped in for Spahnie. There's the great left hander and shut the Yankees out in game seven of the 57 World Series. And so far in this ball game, Greg Maddox has been able to stay away from Bernie Williams until he gets ahead of him and then he comes in on his hands. I think the Braves feel like if you stay away from him, he's not going to hurt you nearly as much as if you try to come inside early in the count. Here's his 2 1 pitch. Three balls and a strike. And Maddox wanted that pitch. You see him shake his head right there. I mean, he was upset because it's a very important pitch. Two and two is a lot different than three and one. Now, watch Maddox's reaction. Right there, he's shows you his frustration with the call and now he walks Williams to start the seventh big difference between a two and two count and a three and one count when you have a guy like Williams at the plate you see Bobby Cox yelling he said that pitch wasn't low the two and one pitch and he knows that Greg Maddox doesn't want to give in three and one to Bernie Williams so two and two pitch was very important that might have caused a few lip readers in the audience to blanch. I didn't really read them, but Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I thought one of the expletives was unmistakable. <laughs> Tino Martinez has walked and lined out. Strike one to him. Bobby Cox was ejected 12 times this year. That led the majors. And we saw Bobby far more animated than usual in the series with New York. The last time these two teams met in the World Series. Cox was tossed from the last game game six at Yankee Stadium in 96. Line foul. Oh and two. Joe Torrey flanked by his coaches Mel Stottlemyre the pitching coach and the bench coach Don Zimmer. The 0 2 pitch misses but not by much and Maddox is getting a little upset himself here early in the ball game Maddox was getting a lot of pitches up and he gave up a couple of base hits on high pitches but here you see he's just off the outside corner and it appears to be off the plate outside. Although fast, Bernie Williams is not regarded as a particularly good base runner. He stole nine bases this year and was thrown out ten times. Still one and two. We talk about, you know, Hernandez making a mistake and Chipper Jones hitting the ball out of the ballpark. Well, that was a mistake right there by Maddox, but Martinez fouled it off. Every time you make a mistake in the ball game, they do not hit it out of the ballpark. Now watch, he doesn't want this ball right there inside. You see Perez having to reach back and drops his head. He knows that he got away with one right there. Lesko had to scoop that one out of the dirt. Williams at first with nobody out, top of the seventh. Yankees trailing one nothing. There he goes. He's got a good jump, and Perez won't even throw. Tough pitch to throw on Bob. He got a good jump, but the ball was sinking down and away. Not a good pitch for Perez to throw on. Bernie gets a good jump. Now watch where the pitch is down and away but he slides in safely without a throw. 
Now watch where the pitch is. This is tough for a catcher to do. Dig the ball out and make the throw. And you see he lost it in the transition there. That's why he didn't throw. And Martinez goes down on strikes. It got away from Perez. And Perez makes a good play. Running out toward the middle of the diamond to make sure that he looked Bernie Williams back before completing the strikeout by throwing to first. Watch the movement on this pitch from Maddox. This is the key to Maddox's success. I mean, this pitch looks like a strike halfway to the plate. See, it looks like a strike. Now look at the bottom falls out of it. Just great movement. Tino Martinez swings at it. And Perez does a good job of holding. See, that ball at one time was a strike. It was above the knees halfway to the plate. But he has such great movement on his pitches that by the time he got to the plate, it was strike three. So in a one-nothing game, the minimum the Yankees were hoping for was that Martinez could pull a ground ball to the right side, get Williams to third with one out. He couldn't do it. Here's Posada. In the third inning, let's take a look at the pitches up. Ground ball base hit. He was getting some pitches up early in the ball game. Now look at him. See, that's the difference. He has found his zone and he's been able to keep these hitters off balance much easier than he was early in the ball game. There's a lot to be said about getting good pitches early because once they get their rhythm, they're in control of the game. Posada hits it in the air to shallow center, backpedaling his wife from shortstop, and he squeezes it. And that was an intentional fastball up. He wanted to get Posada to chase something out of the strike zone. He had thrown him a fastball in, and then he threw this one up and out of the strike zone. See, this pitch is up and out of the zone. Posada can't catch up with it. See the scowl on Posada's face. He knows he went up and out of the zone. Now it's up to a day. In these non DH games in the National League City, the Yankees are without the bat of Darryl Strawberry except off the bench as a pinch hitter. They won't use him in the field. He hasn't played a single inning in the outfield since they brought him back to the big club. Popped wide of first into foul ground goes Klesko. He has no play. Straw man awaiting his turn. He's got a bat just in case. Ramiro Mendoza, Panamanian right hander who was so effective in the ALCS against the Red Sox, getting ready. The 0 1 pitch to Ricky Lede. And we can just watch Maddox at work there. I mean, every pitch now is has a purpose. That pitch there was in under the hands. The first pitch he threw him was in under the hands. Now he has him exactly where he wants him, 0-2. Down and in for a ball. Well, he tried that screwball fastball. It starts off the plate inside, let it move back to the edge. Got his grip and he fans the ball. Same pitch. Second strike out of the inning, fifth of the game for Maddox. And the first time up, he struck Chipper Jones out with a fastball in. He set him up by going away. He strikes him out. The next time up, he's trying to go away the first pitch and he gets it back on the almost same spot he struck him out with. And Chipper makes him pay for that mistake. One to nothing Braves. Chipper Jones, whose dad Larry idolized Mickey Mantle. Chipper is a switch hitter partly because of that. Jones himself had a chance to meet Mickey a few years ago when he was just coming up to the major leagues. First pitch is high, and as we mentioned earlier, the 45 home runs by Chipper Jones this year are the highest single season total for a switch hitter by anyone other than Mantle. 
They tried to start Chipper off with a fastball in just a showing one, and then go away with a changeup. He missed with both. Now it's 2 0. Dangerous pitch for El Duque, and he leaves it low. When Mantle met Jones, he gave him a personally autographed photo, which Chipper sent to his dad. And his dad, Larry Sr., calls it one of the great thrills of his life. On four pitches, El Duque hands him a free pass to start the bottom of the seventh. Another view from the Goodyear Blimp Stars and Stripes. If it's a big sports event, you can bet the Goodyear Blimp is there. We talk about the two key hitters on both squads. One was Chipper Jones for the Braves, the other was Bernie Williams. And we've seen how they pitched to them this late in the ballgame. Maddox got behind Williams and he walked it. El Duque got behind Chipper Jones, so he ends up walking him. He's not gonna, they're not going to give in this late in the ball game. Jones runs on the first pitch to Jordan, who fouls it back. Let's take a look at the jump that Chipper Jones gets. I'm not sure if it was a hit and run or not. Not a good jump because he, he was frozen there. Maybe it was a hit and run. You see him look back very quickly. I guess it was a hit and run. Bobby Cox said he would probably hit and run a lot in this series. Chipper's a good base stealer, 25 of 28 this year. Back easily. The right hander is Nelson, the lefty Mike Stanton, the former Atlanta Brave. Jones with a short lead at first. And Jordan pops it back of short. Jeter at the edge of the outfield grass to take it. And you see how El Duque is holding Chipper Jones now. He just sit there and held the ball for a long period of time. And a lot of pitchers believe that will keep the runner from breaking. Now Ryan Klesko, who prior to tonight, had been El Duque's nemesis, but in this game he's fly to right and tapped to the mound. Apart from Chipper Jones' home run in the fourth inning, I can recall only one ball hit hard against El Duque tonight as Brett Boone and Brian Jordan try to figure the right hander out. Andrew Jones lined hard to Scott Brocious at third base in the fifth. Apart from that, El Duque has been masterful. Another pop up and Brocious wants it. Two out. Let's take a look at El Duque when he is in his regular wind up on the left and when he has a runner at first base. See he just hides the ball completely high leg kick. Now watch the leg kick on the right. This is with a runner at first base. Look at that short leg kick. And he gets rid of the ball quicker. Good job of changing up by El Duque. So Jones remains at first now with two out and here's Andrew Jones. Andrew has had two good at bats against Hernandez worked a full count walk and a 10 pitch at bat back in the second and then lashed the line drive to Brocious in the fifth. to start game four at Yankee Stadium against Roger Clemens tossing in the bullpen he's been used twice in relief in this postseason by Bobby Cox there goes Chipper Jones on the 0 1 pitch Posada's below. got him Chipper Jones cut down to end the seventh and the taut one nothing duel moves to the eighth at Turner Field Let's watch this steal by Chipper Jones. He doesn't get a great jump, but it appears he still gets in there.
as Knobloch tags him up by the knee in super slow motion. You can see that he's in there, and Knobloch tags him up by the shin. Very close play at second base. And the umpires do not have a super slow motion camera out there. Scott Brocious starts it in the New York eighth, and he's three for three. They have four hits, and three of them are Scott Brocious singles. That is it for Orlando Hernandez. Darryl Strawberry heads for the batter's box. Now we'll see whether or not Bobby Cox has a counter move, but John Rocker was not throwing. At least a moment ago he wasn't, so Joe Torre gets him in the game before Rocker gets in the game. The left-handed closer for the Braves. And you at second base, you can see Walt Weiss telling Maddox that he's going to be on the right side of the bag, even though he's going to take the throw if a ground ball is hit back to him. You see him here, but he's still going to take the throw. Ball one to Strawberry. John Rocker has just begun to throw, just this moment, in the Atlanta bullpen. Springer the right-hander, Remlinger the other left-hander. Brian Hunter is in the game for defense, replacing Ryan Klesko at first for the Braves. The defensive alignment has Weiss and Boone both on the first base side of second. And the third baseman, Chipper Jones, is at what normally would be the shortstop position. 2-0 the count. And you see Maddox making a real conscious effort to get the ball in on Strawberry. He doesn't want him to get anything out away from him where he can extend his arms. Three and oh strawberry had homers in both the division series against Texas and the LCS against the Red Sox. He had only 49 regular season at bats and hit three home runs. He is still obviously a feared hitter at age 37. Strike three and one. He walked him. Runners at first and second, nobody out. Well, Maddox definitely trying to get the inside part of the plate against Strawberry. See this pitch in, and it's ball four. And Maddox very upset with himself that he ends up walking Daryl Strawberry. Straw is done. Drew the pinch hit walk. Chad Curtis runs for him. And this is a situation that Joe Torre a lot of times will sacrifice in this situation with Knobloch in the top of the order. Maddox and Chipper Jones have just conferred on how they will handle the bunt if it's bunted toward third base. He squares. He bunts foul. Both Joe Torre and Bobby Cox, each of whom has managed in both leagues, were emphatic in the days leading up to this World Series about how much they each preferred the National League style, the non-DH style, they both say unequivocally that it's just a better game without the DH. And anyone who watched the NLCS could hardly argue with that. All the lineup maneuvers, all the in-game strategy, looking to bunt again, gets this one down, well placed. Hunter has to make a good play, and then it squirts out of his hand. The bases are loaded. Well, that was a good job by Chuck Knobloch. Greg Maddox was breaking off toward the third base side in order to make a play at third base. Brian Hunter is coming in and he bunts it right back through the middle. Now watch Maddox. He will go over here. See him start over there? So he can't field it. It's a tough play for Hunter, although he comes up with it, but he rushes and is not able to make the throw to first base. That was a good bunt by Knobloch to thwart what they were trying to do. Maddox was definitely going to cut anything off at third base. A good play by Hunter to glove it, but then he's charged with the error as he can't make the throw. Sacrifice E3. Bases loaded for Jeter. 
who fouls the first one off. Jeter is singled, grounded out, struck out. And in this situation, the Braves are going to play back. Of course, they have a one run lead. They're trying to get out of this. They're hoping for a ground ball double play. The 0 1 pitch. And Maddox gets ahead of Jeter 0 2. Paul O'Neill will be next. Rocker getting ready. Leo Mazzoni, the pitching coach, rocking back and forth as he always does next to Bobby Cox. And the 0 2 pitch from Maddox to Jeter. He wouldn't chase it, 1 and 2. Maddox struck him out on a sinker away the last time up, so he tries to get him to chase something off the plate. This is a very good 0 2 pitch. If Jeter swings at it, he's not going to be able to do anything with it. Hit toward the hole and through for a base hit. Brocia scores. Curtis has stopped at third. A wise decision by the third base coach Willie Randolph. They still have the bases loaded with nobody out and at the very least El Duque is off the hook. They hit for him in this inning. The game is now tied. And the Yankees still threatening bases loaded nobody out. Well the one thing to watch for is look at Jeter. He's going out there to get the pitch away. Maddox gets it up a little bit and he rips it in the hole for a base hit. And Jeter has done this all season long. And the one thing about the Yankees they keep coming at you all the time and if you give them any help like a fumble sacrifice or a base on balls here issued by Maddox. I mean they just keep coming at you and if you give them any help they usually take advantage of it. Maddox had a three hit shutout going into the eighth. Brocia started it with a sharp single to left. Strawberry walked as a pinch hitter. Knobloch's bunt was misplayed by Brian Hunter loading the bases with nobody out and then Jeter spanked one through the hole to tie the game at one apiece. Maddox is done. Rockers coming into a bases loaded jam and we're coming back. John Rocker the high energy left hander who turned 25 less than a week ago. Had appeared in nine consecutive games and really needed the few days off between the end of the LCS and the start of the World Series. Comes in with no margin for error. The Braves bring the infield in against Paul O'Neill. Bases loaded, nobody out. O'Neill hit only 190 against left handed pitching this year, over 300 against righties. Swings and misses. And that's the key pitch right there for Rocker. Toward the end of the Met series, his fastball wasn't as live as it had been earlier. And the three days rest, I think, helped him get this fastball back. And even though he's a left handed pitcher and he has a good curveball, that fastball is the key to him being able to handle left handed hitters. Switch hitter Bernie Williams is on deck. And the lefty swinging Tino Martinez. In between the pitch pitchers being taken out Bobby Cox was out yelling at the home plate umpire he was very upset he thought he missed a lot of pitches in that last inning for Greg Maddox. Curtis who ran for strawberry at third Knobloch who reached on an error at second Jeter who singled home the tying run at first and the one one pitch up and in two and one. Let me ask you this Joe were you surprised that Cox didn't have either Remlinger or Rocker already warmed up when Strawberry came off the bench earlier. Yes I was surprised but I think he must have felt that Greg Maddox was getting better as the game went along because normally he would have had a left hander ready for Daryl Strawberry. Crucial pitch on two and one. Misses and it goes to the backstop. Curtis started toward the plate but it ricocheted right back to Perez and Curtis 
slammed on the brakes. That was a great base running play by Chad Curtis. You're taught that when the ball goes into the ground to take a step toward home to start right away right there. And I mean he started in but this ball bounces right back to Perez and this is a great base running play because once you commit you're usually going watch Curtis. Now he takes off I mean that's a this is an excellent play there by Curtis. And so the Yankees still have the bases loaded with no one out. With two out maybe you try it. Not with nobody out. There's a ball on the field in right field and the ball boy runs out to get it. With no place to put him. Rocker has fallen behind O'Neill three and one. are in front three to one. Good job by O'Neill. He worked himself into a hitter's count to get the three one fastball. It's middle of the plate in and he's able to get around and pull it. You see pulls it in the hole because the infield's drawn in. You do not have a lot of range and this gets by Boone before he can react. And there's the base hit. See <laughs> Derek Jeter leaping over Boone. Now he decides he's going to third. They cut the ball off. Not a good throw by Brian Hunter and the Yankees have a couple of more runs now it is a three to one lead with first base open they walk Bernie Williams intentionally and they'll take their chances with Tino Martinez So Martinez who had a grand slam in game one of last year's World Series. And here it is at Yankee Stadium of another left hander the Padres Mark Langston. Generally speaking Martinez has not hit well in the LCS and World Series. He's sub 200 for his career. At this level of play. He's a funny type hitter Bob and it just when he's starting to look bad all of a sudden he comes through with a big hit for you. A hit here would break the game open infield in and it's fouled off. The Braves brought Brian Hunter in for defense in this inning. He's been charged with two errors. On his throw to third he didn't get Jeter and that's what allowed O'Neill to move from first to second. Jeter at third. O'Neill who had the big hit through the drawn in infield at second. Williams who was walked intentionally at first with the coach there Jose Cardinal. Three on, three in, and still nobody out. Rockers 0 1 pitch is in there. Three singles, a walk, a sacrifice, a couple of errors, an intentional walk. Yankees making lots of noise in the eighth. Martinez goes down swinging. That's why Rocker is effective against left handed pitching. He gets ahead of you with the fastball, and then he gets you to chase the breaking ball. This is not a great breaking ball, but with two strikes, it breaks out of zone, and a lot of times left handed hitters will chase it. If He's ahead of them in the count. 
Osada is a switch hitter. He turns around to bat from the right side. Most of his at bats during the course of a season are lefty. Joe Girardi would generally start when a left hander starts against the Yankees. Swing and a miss for strike one. Posada was 0 for 3 against Maddox. Now the infield moves back looking for the double play. Fastball is high, 1 and 1. Inside two and one. In that Atlanta dugout, they're already thinking, well, if Rocker can keep this reasonably close, then we'd better get something done in our half of the eighth, because in the ninth, we'll be looking at Mariano Rivera. On the left is Rivera. The 2-1 to Posada. Three balls and a strike. Ricky Lede scheduled next. Left-handed hitter. Joe Torre has already used Chad Curtis as a pinch runner in this inning. Called strike, full count. that number right there 21 to 5 they've outscored their opponents from the seventh inning on and really that's the sign of a veteran team that makes adjustments as the game goes along. The 3 2 pitch he went off speed and got him looking. Posada can't believe it. I think that pitch for Surprised everyone in the ballpark. John Rocker has a good enough fastball that he can throw it three and two, but he comes with a curveball. And watch the delayed reaction by the home plate umpire. And you see the reaction of Posada. He says, No way. But again, they're looking for a fastball, and here comes a curveball. Joe Torre thought he had the bases loaded walk that would force home a fourth run. Now he goes to his bench and sends up Jim Layritz, right handed hitter. You can see him there motioning toward Lede. Come back, Ricky, you're done for the night. Now he's already used Curtis as a pinch runner, so Curtis will stay in the game and play left when we move to the bottom of the eighth. Check it first, and Layritz did go around for strike one. Let's watch the barrel again. No doubt he went on that swing, tried to check it a little too late. Swings and misses at high heat. Layritz has always been a dead fastball hitter. Unless you hang a curveball or a slider, as Mark Wallace. Yeah. Game four in 96. Yankees come back from a 6 0 deficit to win it and even the series across the street at the old ballpark. Layritz took Wallers deep. That last rocker fastball was clocked at 98. Here's his 0 2. Inside. A lot of pitches for John Rocker. 21 pitches here in the eighth inning. In relief of Greg Maddox. The one-two pitch. 
two balls and two strikes to Lairitz. Rocker just a bundle of energy out there. Look at him. He can hardly contain himself. He says candidly, I wish I was good enough to be a football player. He likes the more constant action and the contact of football. So it just turned out I'm a better baseball player than a football player. But I'd rather play for the Falcons than the Braves. There are a lot of Falcons who would rather play for the Braves. One of them is Brian Jordan, I guess, <laughs> who left football behind. Here's the 2 2 pitch. Full count. Just about everybody in Turner Field was waiting for Randy Marsh to punch Leyritz out. Well, it's another curveball. He starts it off the plate outside. It breaks. Looks like it might be a hair low. And you see Perez raising the glove. So after getting ahead 0-2, the count is now full. Three runners will take off on the pitch. They go. Here it comes. He walks home a fourth run. Well, he tried a 3-2 curveball with Posada and got it over the plate. He tries another 3-2 curveball with Leyritz, and it's ball four, and he walks in a run. He had just missed 2-2 with a curveball, comes right back with it again, and I think it's the same call from Randy Marsh that it is low. You see that Leyritz had been frozen. He was looking for a fastball. So he had him 0 2 and he lost him. The Yankees have batted around. Here's Brocious, who started the inning with a single. Scott is 3 for 3. Cuts and misses for strike one. Ball and a strike. And Brocious, as he was in last year's World Series, off to a great start. And he's been the key batter in this entire ball game. He's three for three, but he started this inning off with a base hit that got Greg Maddox in trouble immediately. That one broke sharply down and in. One and two the count. They're trying to get out of a nightmare eighth for the Braves. Not just yet, two and two. O'Neill had a big hit in this inning at third. Williams away from second. Leyritz, who forced home the fourth run with his walk, is at first. And the 2 2 pitch. Full count now to Brocious. Chad Curtis, who ran for Strawberry, is on deck. The runners go, and Brocious strikes out. The Yankees sent 10 men to the plate, four of them scored. They take a 4-1 lead to the bottom of the eighth in game one of the World Series. Chad Curtis, who ran for Darryl Strawberry, stays in the game and plays left field. Out of the bullpen, six-foot, eight-inch right-hander Jeff Nelson. He'll be asked to work the eighth and then turn it over to Mariano Rivera. It's interesting Joe Torre is going to Jeff Nelson instead of Romero Mendoza who has been throwing the ball very very well. But they use Nelson sometimes to set up man and Mendoza at other times. There's Mendoza. Joe Torre who succeeded Bobby Cox as manager of the Braves in the early 80s. At the conclusion of Cox's first tour of duty as Atlanta's manager.
Craig Sega reports from downstairs that John Rocker came into the dugout fuming. Andrew Jones bluffing a bunt and taking a strike. Very upset with the ball and strike calls of plate umpire Randy Marsh. One and one. Nelson, as Rocker sits alongside his ever rocking pitching coach, Leo Mazzoni. Nelson on the mound for the Yankees gives you that big, distracting motion and then throws that nasty slider with that frisbee like motion side to side. One's high two and two Jones has walked and lined a third Eddie Perez is on deck down goes Andrew Jones The last save Mariano Rivera blew was on July 16th against the Braves at Yankee Stadium. The fourth of four blown saves for him this year. Since then, he's allowed exactly one run, regular season and postseason combined. I saw him being interviewed last night, and they asked him about that. He says, I've already forgotten about that. He said, I'll have to beat me again if the opportunity arises. He said, that will definitely not be on his mind. Well Joe Torre told us that a big part of the maturation process for Mariano Rivera a painful part was allowing the fourth game home run in the playoffs a couple of years ago to Sandy Alomar Jr. of the Indians. He said he was able to put that behind him and right there Torre knew that Rivera was going to be his bullpen ace for a long long time. To be a, a closer you have to have the mentality of I remember something Raleigh Finger said. He said, sometime you tame the tiger, other times the tiger has you for lunch. But you have to go back out there. Called strike. Two balls and one strike to Eddie Perez. Way outside, three and one. Walt Weiss is the next scheduled hitter. Ozzie Guillen is in the on deck circle to pinch it for him. Ball four to Eddie Perez. Tomorrow night at 7.30, we'll be back here with game two. Pre-game show includes the on-field ceremony for the living members of the All-Century team. And then it'll be Kevin Millwood for Atlanta against David Cohn for the Yankees. Ozzie Guillen, who had a huge pinch hit in the 10th inning of the Game 6 National League Championship Series win against the Mets. They were trailing by a run. Guillen's hit helped them to tie the game push it to the 11th and eventually they won it in the bottom of the 11th. Joe Torrey now heads for the mound. He's got Mike Stanton out there whose specialty is to work to left handers and here comes Stanton. He wants to hold Rivera back for the night if he can possibly get it to happen that way. Nelson faced only two hitters. So here's Mike Stanton, whose various trips through the major leagues have been very well timed, if nothing else. He's been in the postseason every year since 1991. He was with the Braves from 89 through 95. Went to the Red Sox. They made the playoffs in 95. To the Rangers in 96 in the postseason. And with the Yankees in 97, 98, and this year. Bob, in the past, he's been a you know, power pitcher through a 
pretty good fastball hard breaking ball. Now he's gone to a lot of change up throws a lot of change ups to right handed hitters. Guillen was announced Stanton came in Guillen pulled back Jose Hernandez to the plate. Howard battle another right handed hitter is on deck. Hernandez has some pop. He had 19 homers this year. A called strike. Cuts and misses 0 and 2. There's a good change up. He's starting with a breaking ball and then comes with a change up. Jose Hernandez strikes out a lot, 145 times this year. That one's in the dirt, one and two. Chipper Jones homer made it one nothing into the eighth. Brian Hunter seated next to him made two errors in that four run Yankee half of the inning. One two pitch fouled off. Sends Jose Hernandez packing, and here's a bit more invective from Bobby Cox. Well, he throws him a curveball that starts off the plate outside. And according to Randy Marsh, it breaks over the outside corner. Not a bad looking pitch, especially with two strikes. Torrey back to the mound. Pat Stanton on the back for a job well done. And now he wants Rivera. We were talking about the big home run allowed in the division series in 1997 by Rivera. An opposite field shot to Sandy Alomar Jr. at Jacobs Field. That is the last time he's been touched for a run in the playoffs or the World Series. He's worked seven and two thirds postseason innings in 1999. In the ALCS, he had two saves and a win. Number seven, the last, last save he blew was against the Atlanta Braves in mid July. Howard Battle had been announced. He's pulled back. Left handed hitting Keith Lockhart, their best pinch hitter, is sent up. Strike one. What you'll see from Rivera is a riding fastball up in the zone and a cut fastball, which he threw there. And every once in a while he'll turn one over, but he throws a cut fastball and a riding fastball. And that obviously is the riding fastball up and Lockhart a little late on it. He has such a slow and easy motion that the ball just explodes on you, and you do not have a lot of time to decide whether it's in the strike zone or not. A ball and two strikes. Martinez playing behind Perez at first. And the one two pitch is popped back and out of play. Mariano Rivera is such a cool customer that he's been known to nap in the early innings of a game out in the bullpen. And you know, wake me up when you need me. <laughs> Lockhart stays alive. Slender Panamanian right hander, 6'4 and barely 170 pounds. Another one two pitch. Lockhart slaps it down to Martinez, who'll take it himself. Down go the Braves in the eighth. 4 1 Yankees.
Jose Hernandez stays in the game at short. Out of the bullpen comes left-hander Mike Remlinger, who was 10 and 1 for the regular season, and there are his postseason stats. And one of the things the Braves thought they had an advantage over the Yankees was that their left, their bullpen was predominantly left-handed, and they felt like that could really hurt the Yankees late in the ball game. But Remlinger did not come in to pitch to Darrell Strawberry, so in the crucial eighth inning, so I don't know exactly how that works in the Braves' favor if you're not using them against the left-handed hitters of the Yankees. Leading off in the top of the ninth, it's Chad Curtis. In the four-run eighth, Strawberry batted for El Duque, drew a walk. Curtis ran for him, stayed in the game. And he's in left field now. Swings on the first pitch, skies it to shallow right. Brian Jordan is there. Back to the top of the order for Chuck Knobloch. Except for a tag play on an attempted steal, Knobloch somehow has avoided the ball or the ball has avoided him in this game all the talk about his problems at second base unless I'm missing something on my scorecard he hasn't had a chance except taking that throw from Posada when they threw Chipper Jones out trying to steal and that's true I don't I can't remember another play either but I'll tell you what if you play five or six ball games you can't hide middle infield <laughs> the ball will find the you ball will find you. Knobloch finds his counterpart at second, Brett Boone, who throws him out from the outfield grass. Satori has less to worry about with at least a three run lead going to the bottom of the ninth, and Luis Soho unavailable. Soho in Venezuela for his father's funeral, and the Yankees playing a man short the first two games of this series. Joe says he will not replace Knobloch for defense unless Soho is here. He's not going to go to a rookie like Clay Bellinger who doesn't have much big league experience. Two quick outs on the top of the ninth. Here's Jeter. Last year we talked about the Yankees and how good they were without having a, you know an MVP on their ball club. Well I think this year this guy here has become an MVP and Bernie Williams both of these guys have stepped up and become the stars of this Yankee team and Derek Jeter has just been almost perfect from opening day until the end of the World Series. I mean he has been the guy for the Yankees. Two and, he, and one to Derek and he always seems to be up there in crucial situations. I mean, he was up against Greg Maddox in the eighth inning and came through with a base hit and they've been able to avoid Bernie Williams in those situations tonight. Two balls and two strikes. Derek's RBI single in the eighth tied the game at one. Maddox stands to be the loser. Hernandez the winner. El Duque threw seven innings of one hit ball. The only hit a Chipper Jones homer in the fourth. Full count. And he loses him. Very quiet Atlanta dugout. Faced with the prospect of trying to make up three runs against a guy who's yielded one run since mid July. Braves really were the last team to victimize Rivera. Andrew Jones had a home run against him. Last save he's blown, last homer he's allowed this year. They've got him picked off. Jeter sprints for second, and he's gone. Officially a caught stealing. That puts an end to the top of the ninth.
four Yankee pitchers have combined to one hit the Braves through eight. Hernandez did the bulk of the work. Seven one hit innings with ten strikeouts. And they started the eighth with Nelson Stanton for one hitter Rivera to cap the inning. And now they'll ask Mariano to close it in the ninth. Gerald Williams 0 for 3 with two strikeouts against El Duque takes strike one from Rivera. Hit to second a chance for Knobloch he plays it cleanly awkward looking throw but it gets the job done. Here's Knobloch, gold glover in 97, 26 errors to lead American League second baseman in that dubious category this year. And he's had problems on these types of throws where he has time, but you see there he kind of picks up the target very quickly. He doesn't get a lot on the throw, but he gets, retires the runner. He threw that like he was playing catch with a small child. Oh and two to Brett Boone. Well, we take a look at him. See, he picks up the target very quickly there, but you can see he's opened his hand just to throw it. It's more like a changeup. Hit toward the hole, a base hit. High fastball, Boone, pretty good high fastball hitter. But Rivera's high fastball is a little different than most. He hammers it and hits it in the hole to right field. If you're the Braves, all you're trying to do now is bring the tying run to the plate. You need to try to get a situation where in one swing of the bat you can tie the ball game. They're one base runner away from that. One to Chipper Jones struck and, out homered and walked and with Rivera you're going to have to earn it because he doesn't help you out he comes after you he makes you earn everything you get against him two and up strikes. I think Mel Stottlemyre is wondering where that pitch was. Jones taking all the way and on four pitches he walks to bring the tying run to the plate. And you see Posada talking to the home plate umpire. I think they were both shocked that the 2 and 0 pitch was called the ball. So here's Jordan who was twice fly to right and then popped to short when they weren't sure if they could sign Bernie Williams the Yankees had some interest in Jordan during the offseason eventually Bernie stayed in New York Jordan went from St. Louis to Atlanta apart from the Chipper Jones home run. Brett Boone now at second base is the first brave to get that far tonight. Strike one to Jordan who hit 23 home runs during the regular season. He had a couple more in the LCS against the Mets. And Rivera quickly gets ahead of him 0 2. But the two good cut fastballs right on the outer half of the plate. Greg Myers, reserve catcher, is on deck to pinch hit. On three pitches, Jordan sits down. So he walked Chipper Jones on four, he fans Jordan on three. 
This is the first pitch cut fastball strike on the outside cut fastball again he fouls off this one a little more off the plate and he goes down swinging. A disgusted Jordan is the second out of the night. This was Klesko's spot in the lineup. Hunter replaced him for defense. Myers now bats for Hunter. And hits a little pop that Brocious chases down and foul ground. And game one goes to New York. Chevy player of the game is Orlando Hernandez. El Duque threw seven brilliant innings, marred only by the Chipper Jones homer. He struck out ten. He gets the win. Mariano Rivera notches the save. Orlando Hernandez is now 5 and 0 in the playoffs and World Series. And the Hernandez family, if you count what LeVon did in 97 for the Marlins, a perfect 9 and 0. Out of the Merrill Lynch play of the game as part of the four run Yankee eight. They had the bases loaded. The infield was drawn in. Paul O'Neill, who hit only 190 this year against left handed pitching, managed just to slip it past the diving Brett Boone off the lefty John Rocker. That produced two runs, made it 3 1, and the Yankees win it 4 1. And because of the pressure of the Yankees that put on them, they had to play the infield in. Let's go to Jim Gray. All right, thank you very much, Bob. Paul, you get that awful big two RBI hit in the eighth inning. How did you guys finally resolve Greg Maddox there and, and, and get him out of the game? He had pitched seven innings of shutout. Well, I mean, we got a break there on the bun, obviously. It really, uh, really set things off for us. But, you know, Straw goes in off the bench and gets a big walk, and, you know, you get some runners. And uh, I think, you know, the days off uh, hurts both teams as far as hitting. It's tough to come after not playing for four or five days and go out and have good at bats. But Maddox, as usual, was great, and we're just going to get to him. What can you say about El Duque? He has a one hitter. Turns out the one hit is the fourth inning home run to Chipper Jones, but he turned in a fabulous performance All for you guys. It's so much fun to play behind him. I mean, he's got so much confidence now. He throws from different angles, and he just he puts everything he's got, his heart and soul out there, and he believes that he's going to win. And it's uh, he's pitched some great games for us. Paul, congratulations on game one. Thank you very much. We'll see you tomorrow. All right, Bob, back upstairs to you. Jim, thanks a lot. The Yankees have now won nine straight World Series games. They're eight and one against playoff and World Series competition this year. Again, the final score, the Yanks four, the Braves one. We're back tomorrow night for game two of the World Series, Millwood versus Cone. And the special pregame show begins at 7.30 Eastern and will include the live introduction and ceremony of the MasterCard All-Century Team. That's tomorrow at 7.30 Eastern here on NBC. Tonight, following your late local news, an all-new Saturday Night Live featuring Norm MacDonald and the music of Dr. Dre featuring Snoop Doggy Dog and Eminem. I'm guessing that's not Mantle and Maris. And for those of you who'd like to continue with our World Series coverage, tune to CNBC right now for the post-game report. For Joe Morgan, Jim Gray, and Craig Sager, I'm Bob Costas. This is NBC, home, as you know by now, of the 1999 World Series.